be advancing the, the, the slides for me. Um, so thank you for inviting me to come and uh, talk to you today. Uh, some of the things that I want to share with you is um, the learning that I've gained over about the past four or five years doing research into feedback. Um, the, the roles that I had at Surrey um, were significant because one of the things that I was always tasked with doing was writing action plans in response to the National Student Survey, which inevitably always focused on assessment of feedback. And we were often trying to find quick wins, really, things that would make students happier so that they give us better scores, rather than really thinking about how to improve the learning and to improve feedback so that not only students found it um, more satisfying, but also staff as well. So that really led me to start thinking about feedback in a different way and whether we could stop focusing so much on what we as educators do and instead start thinking about what students do in response to feedback, um, which is sort of where I, where I came from. So um, back in 2010, uh, David Nicholl uh, wrote quite an influential article on feedback called From Monologue to Dialogue. And in this article, he argued that the big problem with uh, assessment and feedback in higher education is because as uh, cohort sizes got bigger, we squeezed dialogue out of the process. You go to the Oxbridge system where they still have the supervision model. There's so much dialogue. It's literally weekly personalised verbal feedback on students' work. But in higher education, uh, beyond the Oxbridge system, we focus very heavily on written feedback and we expect those written comments to do all of the work, really, of, of, of dialogue. And we often send our comments out there to students and hope that they are received, hope that the message reaches them somehow. We don't always know whether the feedback has been understood, whether students know what to do with it, whether it's had any impact on, on the way they think or behave. So this um, kind of challenge of focusing very heavily on the transmission of the message rather than thinking about the reception and the implementation of the message um, is really what I've been interested in um, in terms of feedback. Now, we know a lot about what students say about feedback, but equally important, I think, is the frustration that, that educators often feel about feedback. It takes a lot of time, uh, really time-consuming elements of the academic role. And no matter what we do, it always feels like it's never good enough. Um, because when the National Student Survey findings come out year after year, there's this kind of telltale dip around assessment and feedback. Um, assessment and feedback has been termed the sector's Achilles heel. It's that thing that we know is not quite working. And so on the one hand, we get these messages coming through from this seemingly um, uh, consistent student voice that they're not happy with assessment and feedback. But then we also have um, you, uh, perhaps a mixed message coming from, in some cases, limited student engagement with feedback. So I took this photo in a, um, a university, which I shan't name, um, just before the summer last year. So it was July. The students had all gone for the summer break. And in the corridor was this set of pigeonholes with lots of marked work in it, which had not been collected by the students. And it occurred to me that this, this was sort of like a feedback graveyard. That feedback had just gone there to die. It was never going to be seen, opened, read, have any impact whatsoever. So we've got, on one hand, this, this mixed message. Students are telling us that they're really not happy with the feedback they're getting. Yet we could look on the surface at their behaviour in some cases and think that they're not necessarily interested because they're not picking it up or opening files um, on the VLE. And then we come to the, the frustration on the part of, of, of academics. Now, I don't know if any of you are involved in marking at the moment. Sometimes it feels like it's just a never-ending process. We spend so much time writing comments to students, really trying to give them useful information that can improve their work for the future. And it takes an awful lot of time. Um, and so there's um, suggestions that it's not a good use of academic time, in many ways, to be writing pages and pages of comments if those comments are not going to have an impact. Um, and this, this quote came from um, a participant in a um, study that we did last year saying that they don't do anything to actually help students use feedback. And they will say sometimes at the end of the course, after three years, they've never read their feedback. 
There's no wonder that is not a satisfying process. If you've got an educator putting all of this time and effort into feedback, why would you if at the end of three years there are students saying I've never looked at it? So something is not working. There's um, lots of tensions, mixed messages within the process. Two possible reasons for these mixed messages. One is that feedback, because we talk about giving and receiving feedback, we automatically position students on one side and staff on the other side of that process. Um, this book was written by a couple of business psychologists at Harvard, and there's a fantastic quote quite early on in the book that I think sums this up perfectly. They say, when we give feedback, we notice the receiver isn't good at receiving it. But when we receive it, we think the giver isn't good at giving it. So there is this kind of face-off within feedback. Um, we position givers and receivers of feedback on opposite sides of this process um, with limited dialogue and, and, and discussion between them. And then the other reason why we might have some of these mixed messages. If you just think for a minute about the National Student Survey items or items that are commonly used in internal module evaluations to assess the quality of assessment and feedback. The type of language that's often used in those items is implicitly asking students to evaluate the quality of what they have received, of the feedback that has been given to them. When they evaluate the feedback process in this way, they're really evaluating everything the educator has done without any thinking about their role in the process and how they pick up um, the baton and, and actually see that in feedback input in, impact through. And so we've almost got a tension, I think, within the National Student Survey that we might be working really hard to support students to use feedback. We might be engaging in lots of dialogue and encouraging students to seek feedback or using peer feedback. Yet there's nothing within the National Student Survey that assesses the quality of that kind of process. So perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that the ratings on the National Student Survey seem to be resistant to a lot of the things that we might be doing. So we've trialled a, a, a slightly different item in our internal module evaluation over the last couple of years, which invites students to evaluate the extent to which they've been supported to gather and use feedback to support their learning, trying to reposition the students to have a more active role in that process by the way in which we ask them to evaluate the quality of the process. So that's a bit of background to what I see as being some of the key challenges and some of the tensions within the process. Um, as a psychologist, one of the things that I've been really interested in, in, in doing is thinking about how we can apply some of the understanding that we, we have within that discipline to exploring assessment and feedback in a different way. So I'm going to talk through three different dimensions of feedback, which really draw upon psychological theory, psychological thinking. Um, the emotional dimension of feedback, where it can be quite difficult to hear sometimes, um, when it can be quite difficult to remember feedback and to pull out sort of patterns and key messages across lots of different um, feedback exchanges. And then finally, that motivational dimension, that it's quite hard work to put feedback into practice. And for each of these, I'll think about how we can move forward to support students to make better use of feedback by understanding these psychological processes. So the emotional dimension. Any of us, I think, would uh, agree that feedback can be difficult sometimes. I haven't ever met anybody yet who really looks forward to getting very, very critical feedback and enjoys that process of being exposed to critique. And this idea of, of the evaluation process as a threat to our self-esteem really comes through when you think about what we do when we submit something for evaluation. And we might submit a, an academic paper or we might be submitting ourselves for evaluation when we teach students. We know that we're, we're going to be evaluated on that. And when we submit something, we have a sense of, of pride, perhaps, in, in that product and feeling that you know, we've, we've done quite a good job. So then automatically, any kind of critique, no matter how well-meaning, how helpful, how supportive, is going to go against that internal representation that we've got. And there's some evidence uh, from psychology that over time, our perceptions of what we've done get more and more positive the longer it is between actually producing that or submitting that 
and then it being evaluated. So it almost grows in, in this sort of rosiness, which means there's perhaps even more of a discrepancy when we finally get that evaluation. And we know that this is the case um, with students. So um, this picture came from a study that we did with students where we helped them, um, well, we invited them to, to develop a, a new tool for assessment and feedback. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, but the very first thing that we did in these design sessions that we ran with students was we asked them to represent their experience of receiving feedback. And this was one of our favourites, which we came to see as, as really like a cycle of doom. Um, what the student is saying here is, is they hand in their coursework, it gets marked, and then it comes back to them. And they get the feedback, but the feedback is not useful, they often ignore it, and it's no help for the next thing that they do. And then I don't know how to improve, back to this cycle starting over and over again. And the emotion, I think, is, is, is very much presented in that picture. But when the student was producing this, you can see their writing here was getting bigger and bigger. And they were pressing harder and harder with the pen. And you could feel the frustration really coming through. But this isn't a student problem. This is a human problem. Um, I can think of many cases where I've received feedback which I don't think is particularly helpful, um, where I don't know how to improve and have felt really frustrated with the person who has given me feedback. So I think one of the first things to recognise about the emotional dimension is that it's not a student problem. Students who might get defensive or they might question feedback or they may not feel able to deal with the comments at the time they receive them, those are not student problems, they're human problems. So I'm going to share with you a strategy that um, I've been using with students and it's been really powerful actually in breaking down some of the barriers I was talking about where you've got students on one side and educators on the other. Um, and this is uh, something called intellectual streaking. I don't know if anyone's come across this before. It was developed in the context of medical education by Margaret Behrman and Liz Malloy, who both work in Melbourne. And they wrote a paper about this. Um, suggesting that there's real value to educators exposing their, their um, vulnerabilities and weaknesses to their students, hence the, the term streaking, which actually in a subsequent publication they were encouraged to call intellectual candor rather than intellectual streaking, which I think actually misses um, that, that idea of, of exposing our, our weaknesses and vulnerabilities to students. So they argue that by doing that, we can show students um, that we struggle too. And in some cases, maybe we don't struggle and we can share some of our strategies and, and things that we've experienced. Um, so before I share some of the examples that I've um, given to students, I thought I would engage in some intellectual streaking um, and share with you um, how I often feel in response to feedback. So. I realise that I probably am coming at this from a slightly different perspective because I study feedback and get very excited about it. And so over time, I've started to get a sense of how I can be a better user of feedback. I've started to develop strategies. I've started to understand a little bit more about feedback. And so I have now got to a point where I'm actually very open to feedback and I want to get as much of it as I can because I know what impact it's going to have on me. Um, I am, of course, lying um, because this is actually what I'm like in response to feedback. Every single time I get the same emotional response and it's where I start to feel like a bit of a fraud because I should know how to deal with feedback effectively, but I don't. Um, I can't control that initial kind of feeling I get when I know that critical feedback is imminent. And when I start to read those comments, I can feel the anxiety coming through and start to panic about how I'm going to deal with these comments and, and actually put them into practice. So being very honest about how I experience feedback is, is something then, um, keep going actually, um, that I've started doing with students. If we then look at students' responses to feedback and trying to understand their engagement, we've seen that 
There's no clear pattern really in how emotion influences what students go on to do with feedback. So just in one study that we did, we had lots of students talking about how they use feedback. And the picture in terms of emotion and engagement was really quite complex. So I've got one student here saying, you know, you get your coursework back and you look at the mark. If the mark is good, you don't really bother to read the feedback. So this student was saying if they're happy, they don't really engage with the feedback. Whereas this student was saying that you will ignore the negative comments to save yourself from um, the emotional impact. So both of these students were saying we probably wouldn't look at feedback, but one of them was saying it's because I'm happy with the grade, and one of them was saying it's because it's really, really difficult, it's negative, it's, it's much lower than I thought. So then we started to try and understand a little bit more about why this might be the case. And for this, we drew upon um, control value theory, which is a theory of achievement emotions, the kinds of feelings that we might experience within an achievement context. And one of the really interesting things about control value theory is that it doesn't only distinguish emotions according to their valence, whether they're positive or negative, but their activating potential. And activating emotions are emotions that kind of encourage you to want to do something about it when you're experiencing that emotion. Whereas deactivating emotions sort of discourage you from doing that. They're the kinds of feelings that can be quite crippling because they sort of take away any empowerment to act when you experience these emotions. And what this theory um, puts forward is that there are both positive and negative emotions that are activating and positive and negative emotions that are deactivating. So those two experiences that we saw um, from students where they were not taking action, they didn't feel like they would take action, one of those was a positive emotion, one was a negative emotion. But it's not just the valence that it's import that's important, it's whether or not you feel you want to do something about it. So for example, in, in the... Um, uh, activating emotions. Anxiety is actually an activating emotion because it makes you want to do something to get out of that situation of feeling anxious. You want to kind of correct that. And the same with anger. If you feel angry about an evaluation or something that someone said to you, you want to almost kind of prove that person wrong and show that you can do it. So that is an activating emotion. It makes you want to, to take action. But then if we look at the positive emotions that are deactivating, relief is one that, that is um, very much present as a deactivating emotion, which suggests that if the students are expecting a particular grade or hoping for a particular grade and they get that, they feel relief, perhaps they're not really going to look at the feedback because that emotion of relief is, is deactivating. So this is quite a useful um, tool for students to think about their emotional responses and how that might influence their subsequent engagement. That's all right. So moving to strategies then in, in terms of managing emotion. One of the things that we can do to support students is um, to help them build their feedback literacy. We can't shield students from emotions in the feedback process, and actually we shouldn't, because if we've, as we've seen, even some of those quite negative emotions are activating and, and can encourage them to take action. So one of the things that we did was develop a, a toolkit of resources for educators to use with their students to help them to develop the skills that they need to use feedback effectively. So there's a feedback guide in there which contains, uh, it was written by students, so advice, strategies, tips um, for using feedback effectively. And it's sort of like students are intellectually streaking within that guide. They share their own experiences and some of their own strategies for using feedback. There's then a feedback workshop, which is a set of um, resources and activities that can be done with students to help them try out different strategies for using feedback but also to explore the role of emotion in feedback, for example, and how to manage that more effectively. And then finally, there's a feedback portfolio, which I'll come back to a little bit later, which helps students to synthesize lots of bits of feedback together and start to see what some of the common messages are. Um, the toolkit is, is freely available to download um, from what was the HEA, the Advanced HE website. Um, and all of the resources are available as Word files so that you customize them to 
particular context. Um, so feedback literacy, knowing how to act upon feedback effectively and manage emotion in that process. We can do something to help students um, develop the skills to be able to do that effectively. And we've used it in very different ways um, at Surrey. So we've done this with small groups in sort of tutorial contexts where they've done some of these activities. But we've also um, developed, as of two years ago, uh, an approach where all new first-year students have a, a feedback workshop in their first semester. And in some cases, we've had to do this with very large groups of students, up to around 400. Um, so we've used electronic voting systems, for example, to, to get some interactivity in there. Some programs have used uh, individual activities from the uh, workshop component as a standalone activity when work is being returned, for example. Others have taken a series of activities and, and embedded them at the beginning of se several tutorials so that students do d different activities. And then in response to student feedback, last year we actually worked with the students to develop some um, more independent activities based on the workshop activities. Um, and we post these on the VLE so that the students can go in and do these activities in their own time. And all those videos are freely available as well. We have a, a YouTube channel for the Surrey Assessment and Learning Lab um, and they're all on there. So the second strategy for helping students to manage emotion in the feedback process um, comes back to this idea of, of intellectual streaking again. Um, so I started about 18 months ago um, sharing with students examples of feedback that I'd received on my writing. Um, first of all, they were completely shocked that I get critical feedback on my writing. They, they somehow had this sense that by the time we get to be a, a lecturer, we no longer get anything wrong. So I think they were quite shocked to see some of the things that I'd been, I'd been told. But there's something really powerful, I think, about seeing somebody who you might uh, hold in a position of authority, seeing that they actually go through the same things that you do. I don't know if anyone's active on Twitter. There's been a bit of a, a trend lately for people to post sort of rejection CVs, they're called. So when um, they get a grant or something, rather than saying, look, it's great, I've got a grant, they'll say, I've got a grant, but I've been through six rounds to get to this point, and it's been rejected three times elsewhere. Um, and sort of normalising some of that, that challenge, because otherwise I think we can have a perception that it's really easy for everyone else, but it's really difficult for ourselves. So a um, couple of examples um, that I've picked out which... Um, I think demonstrates some of the challenges that students experience. Um, so the first one, this came from um, a paper that has now been published, but this um, it, we went through quite a difficult process to get there. Um, I like the idea of the experiment, but feel it would have been much better with more effort. And that spelling mistake was in the reviewer's comment. And this opens up a really nice dialogue with students about credibility of feedback givers. One of the things students are often quite reluctant to do in terms of peer feedback is engage in that process because they think that peers don't have the same credibility as, as a lecturer does. But actually, we talk about expertise and perspective as actually being quite fluid things and that it's about the credibility of, of the message itself. This one, um, although rewriting and adding new experiments may be helpful, it's result in something that is more like an entirely new manuscript. So the reviewers were saying here that yeah, you've kind of written this paper, but why don't you write this other paper instead? And I talked to students then about the frustration they experience when they'll get feedback from people that says things like, oh, well, here you could have referred to X, Y, and Z. And they say, well, yes, I could have done, but I, I didn't. I actually, this is what I chose to refer to in my essay. So we talk about that together and, and about strategies for overcoming that. But there's one... Um, example that I think really illustrates the shock that they, they experience when they see that we get critical feedback. So um, this is my, my colleague Rob Nash, who, who I write with, and we had a rejection for a paper just before Christmas. It was literally a couple of days before Christmas. And we're still, the, the, the journal puts this word rejected in the subject line. And the students were so shocked. They're like, they don't really tell you your work is rejected, do they? 
again we just have to kind of get on with it and send it somewhere else but while still there was a glitch in the email system on this day so we got this rejection five times a few days before Christmas um, and so I talked to students about how it ruined my Christmas and I probably shouldn't have let it ruin my Christmas but it, it did because it came at that time when um, I was kind of hoping it was going to be at least major revisions that would be good um, and we had to sort of start all over again in the new year so that, that process of, of sharing with students I think is a really good one for helping them manage emotion. Third strategy um, is one that I've, I've borrowed from a, a colleague who works at the Centre for Research and Assessment and Digital Learning in, in Melbourne. And he wrote a blog post about defanging feedback. Um, it's a really good post. Uh, I would encourage you to read it, but just a, a, a warning. If anyone has a horrible fear of snakes like I do, when you go onto the page, there's just this enormous picture of a snake with its jaws wide open. So you've been warned. Um, it gave me a shot the first time I saw it. But he talks about, again, he engages in this streaking process. In this blog, he talks about his responses to feedback, that he gets really cross and defensive and won't look at it and um, has a bit of a strop in response to feedback. And what he has to do is put it aside for a few days and come back to it. But then he has this strategy, which he calls defanging feedback, where he takes all of the critique that he's been given and he rewrites it into a set of action points. And he says by doing that, it takes the emotional venom out of the comments. It's no longer a critique of his work, it's a list of things to do. Um, and I've shared this with students and some have found it a useful way of dealing with feedback and thinking about how to act on it by just taking it from evaluation of their work towards strategies for, for doing things differently. Okay, so that's the emotional dimension. Um, the cognitive dimension. One of the things that we need to be able to do if we're going to use feedback in the future is, is remember, particularly if it's the kind of verbal feedback we might get in the practice context or um, that we might get in a, in a tutorial or one-on-one or -on -one discussion with someone. Um, so we decided to, to try and find out, first of all, how much feedback is remembered, but also whether students are more likely to remember some types of feedback or, or others. Um, so we decided, first of all, to look at the difference between past-focused, what we call evaluative feedback, and future-oriented, what we call directive feedback. It's a bit like the difference between feedback and feed-forward that, that we might talk about. Now, what we expected was that there would be um, a, a quite strong memory advantage for the directive feedback, the kind of feed forward. A, because a lot of evidence suggests that this is what students want most. They want to know how to improve. And second, in the memory literature, there's um, a lot of theories that talk about memory as, um, I'm aware I'm saying this in front of the memory expert, so... Uh, forgive me if I get this wrong, but ab about having evolved as a function to support future action, that there is this prospective function to memory, that the reason we can remember things is so that we can then do things differently in the future, something like that. Um, so we thought that, that um, this, this future-oriented feedback would be better remembered. So we devised a task where the students came to the lab and they did a writing task. They had to write five short essays on... Um, popular topics, so things like uh, should students have to pay for their university tuition, uh, should Valentine's Day be abolished, um, and they wrote these, these short essays. And then they were told, which was actually a lie, that these essays were going to be taken away and marked by a member of the teaching team, and they'd come back in, in a couple of days, back to the lab, and they'd receive feedback on their essays, after which they'd do another writing task. Now that last part was actually a lie, because they never actually did a writing task again, but we wanted them to believe that they'd have to use this feedback. Now, within the feedback, we, we manipulated the nature of the comments that we presented to them. Could you just put the, put the other one up there? Um, so there was always the same set of comments, but some of them were presented in a past-oriented evaluative style and some in a future-oriented directive style. And different students saw different comments in, in each different format. So just minor tweaks so here we've got um, an evaluative comment you didn't always demonstrate sophisticated awareness of the issues you covered whereas the same comment in a future oriented way you should aim to demonstrate a more sophisticated awareness of the issues that you cover okay um, so 
I'm not going to talk about individual studies, but we've, we've now done about 10 experiments using this, this same paradigm, about 800 odd students. Um, and what we find, first of all, in terms of basic memory, is that even after a five minute delay, students only remember on average around three out of the 20 comments that they were presented with on their writing. And this is when they believe they're going to be using these comments to do another piece of writing very shortly after. So there is a sense that it is sort of in one ear and out the other um, in terms of being able to, to remember these comments. But more surprisingly, we found that it wasn't the future-oriented feed-forward comments that were more likely to be remembered. It was actually the past-oriented evaluative comments. Um, we found what, what we've called now an evaluative recall bias. People remembered on average 47% more of that evaluative feedback than the directive feedback. We also found a, an evaluative retrieval style where even if students had been presented um, with directive feedback, they tended to recall it in an evaluative way. They tended to take all of this feedback, even if some of it was directing them to future improvement, they took it as evaluation of what they had done. And this seemed to be a really strong um, effect. So what we're saying here is not that we should stop giving students feed forward. Um, feed forward is, is often just changing the, the, the framing of the comment. Um, we have got some, some more recent findings that are currently under review, um, which gives a hint as to where this evaluative recall bias is coming from. And it seems to be a selective memory search, that when we search our memory for feedback, it's that evaluative information that comes to the fore most readily. Um, but I can talk a bit more about that if anyone's interested. Um, also within the cognitive dimension then, one of the challenges um, with feedback is students are constantly getting feedback from peers, from learning advisors, from tutors. And it's on different tasks, different modules at different times. How do you make sense of all of that information to get an overall idea of right now what are your strengths and weaknesses and what should you focus on on developing so there's a there's a sense of pattern detection really in, in feedback that you want to be able to pull out the, the sort of common messages that are coming through and this again was a quote from a student one of our studies who was saying that they realized they should go back and, and try and find out what the common messages were that was coming through their feedback um, but it's a difficult thing to do. It takes time um, and it's not necessarily that easy to do. So um, you could just go on to the next one. Thank you. So I mentioned the portfolio um, element of the original toolkit, which really was trying to help students do this, to, to synthesize feedback and detect patterns in what was being said. Um, so a couple of years ago, we um, got some funding to work with, again, with a group of students to design um, an e-portfolio version of this um, feedback portfolio, which sits within the VLE. Um, and it does three things. It, it encourages students to synthesize feedback. And it does this by um, every time students have got some feedback. So it could be formal feedback on an assignment. It could be verbal feedback they've got from a discussion or from a practice mentor, for example. Um, they can submit a feedback review. And that simply means them entering into the system what the feedback is telling them about what they've done well and what they need to improve. And they can then tag these comments against a set of uh, different skills. And so what they can then see is a, a visual representation of, of which skills are coming up most commonly in terms of their strengths and their areas for development. So it's doing that pattern detection work for them. There's then a skill development tool so they can go in and uh, having identified something that they need to work on, access podcasts, videos, books, articles, or book directly onto uh, learning development workshops to actually work on that particular skill. And finally, there's an action planning tool so it helps them to set targets for how they're going to take these steps to use feedback and then use that as a basis for dialogue with personal tutor. Um, so this is the main dashboard that students see when they, um, when they log in. So this is the, sort of the visual representation of their, their strengths and their areas for development. Um, and then they can access the resource bank and build an action plan and so on. Um, so we're in the second 
second full year of, of using this now. Um, the first year we launched just to our uh, first year students um, and we had about 70% uh, engagement with, with the tool um, and we've now got about 9,000 students who are using this, this regularly um, as part of their engagement with feedback. Okay, so finally, the motivational dimension. This question, do you have a TAA deficiency? I'd be incredibly surprised if anybody says yes, because it's a completely fake illness. Um, this was used by psychologists to explore people's responses to receiving information. So receiving some kind of information about yourself, what kinds of actions would people take um, on the basis of that? So in this study, um, which was carried out in the States, they had a group of students who um, came to a, a lecture theatre because they were having a, a briefing. And it turned out this briefing was about um, this, this illness called TAA deficiency. Um, so they saw this information video and this displayed the side effects of the illness. And it was, showed that it, it was not a particularly nice um, thing to have. And the students were told the reason they'd been called to this briefing was because they had the option that day to be tested to see if they were susceptible to developing this illness. So lovely and ethical, this study. Um, so they could, they could choose at the end of the session to, it was a very simple cheek swab uh, test, and they would know whether or not they were susceptible to developing TAA deficiency. Now, in one condition, the students were told that if the test came back positive and they were susceptible to the illness, they'd have to take medication for around two to three weeks, and that would clear up the issue. Um, they would no longer be susceptible. Um, and around one in two of the students chose to have the cheek swab test in, in that condition. In the other condition, the students were told that if the test came back positive, they'd have to take medication for the rest of their lives. So the, the feedback, the information here was telling them they'd need to do something quite difficult and quite effortful. Um, in order to resolve the issue. Now, in that condition, only one in three of the students decided to take the test and get the, get the feedback about their susceptibility. So this study illustrates what psychologists call the, the information avoidance effect, where if we think we're going to be given some information that requires us to do something that's quite difficult and effortful and time-consuming, we'd almost rather not know, because then we feel like we've got to do it. Um, and so we all can almost avoid getting that information. And sometimes this information avoidance effect, um, I think, can play a role in, in students' responses to feedback. Um, we were talking earlier about killing students with kindness sometimes with feedback. We give them loads and loads of really detailed comments, and their work is covered in annotations. It can be completely overwhelming. What do they do first? Which bits are most important? And how do they work out how to respond to all of those comments? It can just look like too much to do, too much to fix. So this information avoidance is, is something that's quite interesting, I think. And yeah, so this, this student saying um, here, it's, it's time consuming to go through all of the feedback. It would be better if someone just gave me bullet points of what I need to do. I think the important message there is not necessarily making it easier for students, but really pointing out what are the priorities for them to work on right now? What are the things that they really need to focus on rather than everything that they could possibly do to change a particular essay, for example? So if we can understand these, these challenges, perhaps we can then start to think about how to engage students um, more effectively with feedback. Um, so we did a, a systematic review of the literature on students' engagement with feedback. And one of the things we did in this was we looked at existing interventions or strategies that people have tried to support students to, to use feedback more effectively. And in each of those cases, we looked for the author's rationale. So what were they trying to develop in students by using this particular strategy? And we found that there were four, which really underpin the, the main skills that you need to use feedback effectively. If we can help students to develop these skills, maybe they might feel more motivated to take action on feedback. So self-appraisal, being able to recognize your strengths and weaknesses. Assessment literacy, being able to take the perspective of a marker to understand what a good piece of work looks like in the context of the discipline. Goal setting and self-regulation, so setting yourself targets for improvement and then monitoring your own progress towards meeting those targets, perhaps adjusting your strategies if it seems they're not working. 
And finally, engagement and motivation is a key skill underpinning use of feedback. So a lot of the interventions in our review, the aim of them was, was just to encourage students to look at feedback more often and, and to be more motivated to engage with it. Um, there's also, I think, a bit of a, a, a conundrum around students' engagement with feedback, that if we don't really understand what the challenges are for them, we don't necessarily know how to help them overcome those barriers. And again, motivation is a key one here. So um, in some focus groups we did with students, we didn't ask them specifically about what gets in the way of them using feedback. Instead, we just uh, gave them some example feedback comments and asked them to discuss in their groups what actions they would take in response to the feedback. And of course, what they discussed were the reasons why they couldn't use the comments or what would make it difficult for them to use them. And some of the reasons why it can be difficult for students to engage with feedback, it's not necessarily that they're not bothered, it's, it's that there are actual barriers getting in the way. Um, awareness, so understanding what the feedback means, decoding the, the academic language within feedback can make it difficult to use. Cognizance, actually knowing what strategies, what steps you should take to put feedback into practice. You might understand your feedback and know that there's something you need to improve, but how do you actually go about doing that and how do you know you've been successful? Agency to actually put feedback into practice. Is there an opportunity to use that feedback on something else? Is it possible to feel like you can improve on the basis of feedback? And finally, volition. The students were very honest in telling us that sometimes it just feels like too much hard work to engage with feedback. Uh, David Carlos, University of Hong Kong, he talks about uh, applying feedback, particularly across different types of tasks, as being hard graft. It does take time, it does take effort. Um, and actually, when you've got a lot of other assignments to do, it may not be something that is a top priority at that point in time. So, finally, some strategies for helping students to take more ownership and to feel more uh, in control of their use of feedback. First one is giving them ownership. We often start the feedback process with us giving comments to students and us deciding what we're going to comment on in their work. What we could do is ask students to request from us what they would particularly like to receive feedback on. So there's a strategy um, which Sue Bloxham developed called Interactive Cover Sheets. Many people do versions of, of this, um, where when students submit work, you invite them to request what they would particularly like you to comment on. And as a marker, you can then direct your feedback in response to the student's request. I think interactive cover sheets, it's a bit like um, with a game of, of tennis, that it's the student who's making the serve. They are making the request for particular elements of feedback. We can then respond by giving them uh, comments that target those areas. And then perhaps they might come back to us and say, well, thank you, this was something that I've been working on. Could you tell me how I'm getting on now? So it can bring that sense of dialogue into the feedback process. And it also means that we can produce less feedback, but more targeted feedback that really addresses the things the students are, are wanting to know about. Second one is um, ensuring that comments are actionable. If we're going to be writing written comments to students, there should be something that they can do with that information. Um, one of the things I often do is, is talk to staff who are very frustrated about their, their feedback evaluations because they think they've been spending ages providing really detailed annotations, but then the students are scoring them quite low in the module evaluation. So we'll sit down and go through all of the annotations on the students' work. And in each case, I'll say to them, what action were you expecting a student to take in response to this feedback? And often they, they can't answer that. The, the, the question mark feedback comment is quite a common one. You don't know what's not clear, why it's not clear, how it could be clearer. Um, so then we talk about reframing those comments so that there is an action that a student could take. So written comments should be actionable, and that might help students feel more motivated to use them. And finally, um, thinking about feedback having somewhere to land. So I'm, I'm borrowing from David Bowd here, who, who talks about the importance of design in feedback. That if we want feedback to be effective and have an impact, we need to build that into our assessment design in some way. 
So there should be somewhere for those comments to go, somewhere for that feedback to land on another task, um, something students might be doing in class, for example, but somewhere for students to actually put that feedback into practice. And often in our professional lives, we, we have the opportunity to do this. Feedback quite clearly has somewhere to land. When we submit a paper, we get the opportunity, hopefully, to revise it and resubmit that paper using the feedback. There's somewhere for it to land. But students don't always get that opportunity because that task might have come at the very end of the modular unit, they've moved on to something else, and there's nowhere for that feedback to go. So a couple of um, suggestions as to, to how this can be done. Um, common ones like having a, a series of tasks, smaller pieces of work which build on one another, where the feedback can be applied from one to the other. Um, Two-part tasks where, for example, um, students might do a presentation and use the feedback to inform a, a written submission. My particular favourite is a version of, of a formative piece followed by a summative piece where um, rather than giving lots of detailed comments on a piece of work at the end of a module where that effort might be wasted, repurposing that effort to another point in the cycle where the feedback has somewhere to land. So students submit a draft or a detailed outline and get really detailed feedback at that point where it's got somewhere to go. Then the final piece is, is graded against the rubric but without the detailed comments because it's going to have less impact at that point in time. But better still, build into that process some grading for students' engagement with feedback. So one variant of this is where students submit with the final piece um, the equivalent of a letter that we might write to a journal editor saying how we've used the comments from the reviewers to inform the submission that we've made. The students can actually say, this is how I've used feedback from the draft to inform my final submission, and part of the grade is reserved for that. So there's literally the, the use of feedback built into the assessment design. Finally here, pre-task guidance. Um, a lot of people use exemplars or self-assessment or peer feedback before students complete a piece of work to help them get an idea of standards and criteria. That, that is feedback. Again, it's repurposing some of that earlier on in the cycle, showing students what a good piece of work looks like. Getting them to try and produce a really bad piece of work is another good way of doing it making all those mistakes and thinking about what a bad piece of work might look like against the criteria. So using some of that time for feedback earlier on in the cycle to inform student strategies ready for the final submission. So my final point um, comes back to this idea of students on one side and us on the other. One of the things that we've done through these projects is involve students very heavily in the work that we've done. They've been um, paid researchers on these projects. They've designed tools and resources. And that in itself has opened up a really useful dialogue around feedback where we, we share a lot more with each other about our own experiences. Um, so, for example, students who designed the portfolio, there's now an ongoing process where students in the second year will go to Freshers' Fair to tell the new students about this tool that, that they developed. And we've also taken students to conferences to present the findings from the project so that they are really part of the research team. And we've talked in, in another paper, which I'm not going to mention today in any detail, but about the idea of, of a 50-50 shared responsibility between staff and students for making feedback effective. We've both got to do our bit. It's not the case that it's all down to educators to give good feedback, and that's the end of the process. And it all comes back to design. So if we really want this um, kind of ethos of feedback where students are really taking on their share of the responsibility for making it work. It's about designing learning environments where students' participation is valued and really part of the way in which we talk about feedback. A couple of ideas of, of how we can do that, but bound to be many more that are discipline-specific and relate to the kinds of uh, structures and processes that, that go on in different places. So I will leave it there. time. <laughs>
Yeah, it's a really good question. And one of the, the, the challenges that we've definitely had with all of this is working with those disciplines where there's a right or a wrong answer rather than the, the nuance that you might get in other disciplines. Um, I suppose one way of doing it would be to invite students to, again, think about the process and to talk through the process of how they would go through um, tackling a, a problem like that. Um, it's, yeah, it's challenging and without knowing too much about maths, I'm not sure what other suggestions I can give. Um, but yeah, the criteria are, are it's right or it's wrong really, aren't they? I guess there's not much grey area in between. Okay. Yes, and then if you were able to correct or even appear were able to correct or discuss any things they've missed out or where they might have gone, gone wrong somewhere, I suppose it's more hypothetical then, isn't it, rather than on an actual problem, which, as you say, would give the answer away. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we had exactly the same experience the first year that we did it. That, that it was, um, you, you could see the kinds of students who were engaging were probably the ones who needed that kind of support the least, and the ones who needed it the most were, were not engaging. Um, part of it, I think, comes from um, students really understanding the purpose of that. Um, what, what we found certainly was that there were some students who were not engaging with it, who thought that if they drew the marker's attention to what they thought would be their weaknesses, they'd actually get a, a lower mark um, because they were sort of flagging up the things that they needed to develop, which they thought would um, lead to a lower grade. And we sort of explained to them that we'd pick those things up anyway. Um, but in a way, it's almost kind of showing awareness and starting a conversation. So I agree with you that making those kinds of things compulsory can be difficult. Um, and can lead to perhaps some unintended consequences. But I suppose it's, it's again, um, do the students see value to it? If they don't have to do it and they think, well, I don't perhaps don't know what I want to get feedback on. Um, I've seen it done similarly with sort of a, a menu kind of approach where students can select from a predetermined list of things what their priorities are, which might help those who are less feedback literate who just look at their work and go, I have no idea. Um, or building it somehow into the process where there's some reflection on using feedback from a previous assignment and using that to inform what they're asking for as a small portion of the grade. Um, other than that, I haven't come up with anything so far. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, no, thank you. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, so the first point, I suppose, is that anything like this works best in conjunction with supporting students to develop their evaluative judgment. So we know that um, from several studies, students' uh, dissatisfaction with feedback is often dissatisfaction with the grade, or not necessarily dissatisfaction, but just not getting the grade they expected, misalignment between their expectations and reality. So part of this, I think, is about helping them better align their, their expectations. So developing evaluative judgment, being able to recognize quality um, in, in terms of criteria, knowing how to really break down those criteria and work out what they mean. But beyond that, I think that's why having something alongside that final piece that is about using feedback does differentiate students, because you could have some who just took a very surface approach to using comments from the draft and it looks like actually they've, you know, they've used them all but actually they may not have properly broken those down and thought about what they need. So by incorporating the, the additional portion of the assessment which is about how they've used the feedback from the draft, it's not just so formulaic as saying you know these are the comments, this is what you can improve, do each of those comments and you'll get a better grade. Third point, I think, is, is again that we can use our own experiences here. So I've had situations where um, I've responded to every single comment a reviewer <coughs> has given me and it's come back and either it's then been rejected, which is the worst case situation, but also the reviewers have said, no, actually, I'm not happy. I think I haven't really engaged with them. So I think there is a sense to which when we get feedback like that with the opportunity to use it, we can think we've ticked everything off and, and applied that feedback, but actually we haven't really engaged with it in a very analytical way and really put it to, to use to its full advantage. Um, so I think, yeah, building their evaluative judgment, building into the process something about how well they've used the feedback, not just have they you know, put those things into practice, and then talking about the importance of really engaging with comments, not just looking like you've done everything you've been told to do. And so I very much would end that was kind of thing as you change. And also the fact 
Yeah, I think the students have got ownership, certainly of some of the, the, the strategies that developed this for other students, and so they've almost taken on that role of, of ambassador. Um, but you've reminded me of um, something that came up in the focus group studies, um, which was very much a, a social process. I, I'm not a social psychologist, so I don't know how it would relate theoretically, but students were saying that um, they knew the people they wanted to avoid on, on feedback day. That day when the feedback has been returned, they knew that there were those people who go around going, I'm so happy, I've done so well. Um, and that actually made them less likely to read their feedback because they felt that they were almost comparing themselves to, to those students. Um, the, other, the other example, we, a while ago, we switched our student staff liaison committee rather than the academics really having anything to do with it we, we invited final years to be the chair of the committee to, to run the meetings and it was brilliant because when the first year started moaning about something the final years would just say oh for goodness sake get over it that is really nothing you need to worry about you know what you're doing is great you're getting really good stuff and I don't think that would have had the same impact if we'd told them to stop moaning um, but because it was other students it, it was really really effective actually and we just got to sit there and say nothing uh, with final years telling them to shut up and stop moaning. Brilliant. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know enough about, again, <laughs> clever things like maths and how that works. Um, but one strategy that I did see, um, I think it was our, it's our vet school, um, it was multiple choice exams with, with computer based. So, a similar kind of thing, they reuse the questions every year. Um, and rather than giving the answers or, or feedback, um, what they did was they, they broke the paper into different sections, different topics, and then they would tell the student how many or what percentage they got in each topic. So they would at least see, well, that area is a strength or that's where you really lost marks. Um, so it, it's, it's personalized, but it's on a much higher level than actually the components. I don't know at all if that would work with the kind of thing you're talking about, but... It's challenging, isn't it? That the um, someone in uh, I can't remember where it is. I think it might be in Hong Kong in, in the School of Law does something which I think is quite horrible to students, but they quite like it. So after they've done an exam, they have the opportunity to stay in the exam room and get some instant feedback. So he would talk through what the right answers were or what the best answers were. So you've got some students who then suddenly think, ah. I did the complete opposite to that. But it's right at that point where they can remember what they've written. Um, it's verbal. It, it, doesn't, you know, it can't go anywhere. It doesn't leave the exam room. Um, students really like it. Um, exactly, exactly. And, and they can remember and think about what they had written rather than, you know, even if they, they go and get feedback three weeks later on their exam, they can't necessarily remember what they what they wrote, what they were thinking at the time, why they wrote, wrote. So I don't know if there's anything in there as well. Thank you. Thank you.